So again, welcome. We have the slides up and, and ready. Uh, my name is Steve Buser. I'm one of the, the hosts here with the Asheville Young Center, and I'll be kicking us off, and Murray Stein will be joining uh, just shortly. So Jung and the Religions of the East is our topic today. Presenter is Dr. Murray Stein. He is our presenter. I will be hosting, and Ryan Deegan will be our technician in the background. You'll likely see him pop up occasionally here and there. Uh, as usual, we have many countries joining us today, which we're delighted to announce. We have Australia, Colombia, Canada, France, Hong Kong, Japan, Scotland, Slovakia, Sweden, Switzerland, the UK, and of course the US. We will be 90 minutes today. Uh, we'll most likely have some time for questions, so please send any questions uh, via the uh, chat feature. You'll see that on the, the software. You can click to ask a question, and uh, I might be able to break in and squeeze in a few questions here and there. Make sure your audio settings are correct. You need to have clicked either the microphone and speakers button or the telephone you know, button. Uh, most people will use the microphone and speaker functionality on their computer or mobile device. Make sure to play with the various features on the software. Click on the full screen mode to magnify it. You can also enlarge the presenter's videos or slides with the different you know, buttons and sliders. So make sure you put that to what feels right for your screen. We are recording today. So if you send over a question and don't want your, your name, uh, or country, you know, read off, please, you know, say so. Please say you're anonymous. And if you are able to put in your name, it's nice to uh, say who's asking a question you know, today. Our next seminar will be on April 11th, and it will be on Jung and Jewish, Jewish mystical traditions. And Tony Wolfson will be our uh, seminar speaker for that one. Should be very good. We're very much looking forward to that one. And then to introduce Dr. Murray Stein. He's a supervising training analyst and former president of the International School of Analytical Psychology, Zurich. He is author of Minding the Self, recently released by Rutledge Publications, and he presently resides in Switzerland. So without further ado, let me turn over to Dr. Murray Stein. Um, this is the third in the series of uh, seminars, webinars on Young in the World Religions. There will be two more after this, as has been already stated. The next one will be with Tony Wolfson on Young and the Jewish tradition, Jewish mystical tradition in particular. And the fifth one with Jerome Bernstein on uh, Young and Native Religions. Um, the <clears throat> first uh, webinar was on Young and um, religion in general, an introductory uh, lecture. And in that one, I focused mainly on Jung's text, uh, Psychology and Religion, the Terry Lectures of 1936. And um, that uh, text Jung, uh, covers a lot of ground uh, discussing the relationship between psychology and religion in general and focusing particularly on what he calls natural symbols and original religious experience, which he distinguishes from uh, the sounds in the background. I don't know what that is, some noises. Uh, he distinguishes original religious experience and natural symbols and the appearance of natural symbols emerging from the unconscious from a uh, religious experience that takes place within the context of traditional religions. Um, and uh, he observes the appearance of uh, natural symbols and original religious experience within the context of analysis, his own self-analysis as it took place during his Red Book period and the analysis with his patients. Um, this, this is a, a kind of religious or spiritual development that takes place within analysis quite outside of any particular religious tradition. And the content of those symbols and experiences depend somewhat, but not uh, completely, upon the background tradition from which the patient comes. So if the patient is from a Jewish tradition, chances are that there would be uh, symbols appearing that would have something to do with that tradition, if they're Christian or if they're Hindu or Buddhist. Uh, 
perhaps uh, symbols that would somehow reflect or resonate with those traditions. But um, Jung treated these uh, natural symbols sui generis. They, they had their own standing. They were images from the collective unconscious. They reflected the, the spirit of the unconscious, and the archetypal dimension of the unconscious. And it was possible, Jung felt, to elaborate a kind of personal spirituality out of these inner experiences. But then, on the other hand, he was very interested in exploring the symbolism of all the religious traditions um, in the interest of a kind of comparative uh, work, comparative psychology, if you will, comparing uh, symbolisms of um, the various religious traditions from all around the world. So um, Jung was doing a kind of comparative uh, 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 study of um, the kinds of symbols that were appearing in his analytic work and in his own life from his own dreams, uh, comparing those with uh, images, symbols, uh, processes, spiritual development processes from religious traditions elsewhere. In the second seminar, we focused on Jung's um, writings about his own background tradition, Christianity. Jung was deeply embedded in a religious tradition, though he did not subscribe to its uh, tenets, to its creeds, to its dogmas. He nevertheless viewed those dogmas as expressions of the collective unconscious, solidified over time, over centuries, by rational thought of very uh, gifted and intelligent theologians who put the pieces together. Uh, the origins come out of the same well that uh, big dreams and uh, archetypal dreams, symbolic dreams come from. But in the traditions, they are cemented together. They are put into a, into a structure that uh, uh, contains the believers so that all uh, are headed in the same direction, have similar experiences, and in a sense are protected from original uh, religious experience and natural symbols as a result. What, the, uh, what being contained in religious traditions fully contains, subscribing, believing, does to the psyche is it cements off or walls off uh, the possibility to experience those parts of the psyche that are not uh, within the tradition or not accepted by the tradition. And those parts of the psyche are often looked upon as um, evil or bad or uh, disturbing or misleading so that um, dreams are okay as long as you dream about the dogmatic images, but if you start dreaming about something else, they're seen to be coming from the devil or from uh, uh, another source that should be rejected. And, uh, and so there's a kind of protection on the one hand, defensiveness on the other. And Jung felt uh, in modern times, uh, moving forward with the process of individuation, people need to be um, uh, allowed to experience the full range of psychic possibilities within themselves. So he uh, did never, he never steered people directly into uh, religious traditions unless he felt that they needed those protections and defenses, um, that they, or that those images spoke especially powerfully to those individuals, because sometimes the dogmatic symbols uh, speak very loudly and, and very convincingly and give life a great deal of meaning. So Jung was not opposed to that, but for the modern person, as he uh, thought of the modern person, described the modern person, um, the, the uh, range of possibilities for experiencing the psyche were much broader, much more open, and would come into analysis one way or another in the form of dreams, because in analysis, one opens the door to the unconscious and lets in that kind of material. One does not, does not protect oneself from the shadow and from um, the um, other features of the uh, unconscious, personal, or collective, but rather tries to look at them, reflect on them, and perhaps integrate them into one's conscious life. So um, uh, with regard to his own religious tradition, 
uh, Jung was well, at deep roots, uh, but he had grown beyond it or grown out of it, fallen out of it. He was a modern man. He was scientifically minded. And yet he felt the need for um, finding a way toward a kind of spirituality that would uh, satisfy his own need for what he calls a myth. Uh, and in uh, his um, autobiography, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, he states how at the beginning of his um, deep descent into his own inner process in 1913 when he broke with Freud, uh, he confronted the question, what is your myth? He asked himself, what is, what is my myth? Uh, it's no longer the Christian myth. I, I'm not a part of, not deeply uh, uh, committed or uh, I'm not a believer. Um, and so he set out on a journey to find his own personal myth. And that is the story that we find in the Red Book. Now, with regard to the Eastern religions, um, Jung was of two minds. Uh, one is they were tremendously interesting and appealing and alluring and had a lot to offer and teach us. On the other hand, we had to be careful, uh, Western, Westerners, not to become imitators of cultures other than our own because that would only foster a very superficial uh, appropriation of what those traditions have to offer. So Jung looked at them with some detachment. He interpreted them. Uh, he uh, wrote commentaries on several uh, texts from Eastern religions, as I will show you in a few moments. Uh, but uh, I want to uh, uh, start this uh, presentation by uh, uh, indicating that uh, he was neither uh, a, uh, a rejecter of other traditions nor a subscriber to them. He was a student of them. He was interested in them. And he wanted to try to understand their symbolism and their processes, their spiritual processes, um, in, a, uh, in a psychological way, and perhaps learn from them and appropriate some of their uh, wisdom for his own purposes in psychology. Um, now I'm going to go to the slideshow. Um, and I want to uh, begin this by recounting an experience that Jung writes about in the Red Book, because this has to do with his attitude toward the East and toward Eastern religions. He describes a uh, uh, a confrontation, a meeting, with a figure named Isdabar. Um, this is at the beginning of uh, Liber Secundus, the second book of the Red, uh, in uh, uh, the Red Book. Um, and Isdabar is a gigantic figure who comes from the East, and uh, Jung is journeying toward the East. Now, this journey toward the East is something that uh, a number of Europeans were doing in Jung's day, uh, including famously Hermann Hesse, Journey to the East, he even wrote a book with that title uh, a little later, came a little later in the 1920s. This took place in 1913-14, when Jung was deeply engaged in his own inner active imagination work. And um, Isdabar represents a figure from the East, uh, a mythological figure larger than life, and uh, he's really, uh, uh, Isdabar is another name for Gilgamesh. And Gilgamesh, uh, in the Gilgamesh epic, uh, goes in search of the herb of immortality in the West. And so uh, Isdabar is moving toward the West, Jung is moving toward the East, and they meet uh, in the high mountains that separate the two regions. And they have a conversation and a confrontation, and uh, Isdubar is deeply wounded by what Jung tells him about the scientific knowledge available to people in the West, uh, and uh, the mythological way of thinking no longer works. We have a better way of thinking. We can fly airplanes. We've got <clears throat> watches, and so on. He shows Isdubar his watch. Isdubar is astonished, and so on. And this is uh, deeply wounding to Isdabar. He falls to the ground, and uh, Jung becomes very concerned about him. How can he help Isdabar? Uh, 
uh, to recover his health and his strength. And so they have a discussion and uh, uh, Isdabar says, well, can't you call somebody uh, from the West to, to come and get us? And Jung says, uh, well, they, they wouldn't really help us very much. They can't really help you. Um, why don't we look to the East? Isn't there anything in the East that could help you? And then the critical part for our purposes today, uh, part of the conversation occurs in which Isdabar says, no, you, um, you mustn't go to the East. Uh, if you go to the East, the sun will blind you. The sun is so bright there that you're not used to it, that it will blind you. There is no help for us in the East. Uh, and that is something that registered very deeply with Jung, I believe. That message from his active imagination that it would be dangerous for him to go to the East. Many people did go to the East in the sense they sometimes they traveled to the countries of the East or they deeply uh, immersed themselves in texts of Eastern religions, of Buddhist or Hindu texts. Schopenhauer famously read from the Upanishads every night before he went to bed. Um, th there were a lot of students. It was very popular and, and figures from the East were coming into the West, gurus and teachers. Uh, teaching yoga and teaching um, all kinds of meditation practices and exercises. In fact, Jung was feeling that the West was being slightly overwhelmed by these uh, teachers from the East. And so he pulled back. And uh, I think he said to himself, this is a great temptation for me. Uh, they certainly do have something that we don't have and need, but uh, it's probably too much for us to digest. We can't handle it. So I'm going to find another way. And so that was, uh, that was Jung's decision. And he set out, of course, on his own path of uh, active imagination and uh, uh, the uh, individuation process as he then outlines it in his works and in his writings, um, as he lived it in his life, our way is to stay with our own culture, to stay with our own nature, to let the spiritual life emerge from us in a natural way, not to try to graft on any foreign or alien traditions and uh, imitate those, but stay true to our own inner process and follow that. Now that did not at all hold him back from, from reading uh, texts uh, uh, from uh, Eastern uh, religions, uh, many texts of many kinds commenting on them, as I will show in a few minutes. Uh, but uh, he was um, hesitant about uh, advocating uh, for, for others or himself uh, stepping too deeply into those traditions in the sense of learning their methods, trying to follow them, uh, and uh, trying to benefit more directly from them. He was interested in parallels. He was interested in comparisons uh, because they would teach him something and open up his perspective on the collective unconscious and on the human psyche. But uh, as for practicing, he wouldn't go there. Now, I'm going to skip ahead uh, a couple of decades um, to uh, 1937, late 1937, 1938, when Jung made a trip to India. Um, India was, of course, the, uh, the, the, you could say, the holy grail, practically, for people on quest, uh, on quest for wisdom and, and uh, uh, the religions of the East, more than China was. China uh, was more or less off the map, but India, uh, with its long traditions, uh, the Hindu tradition, Buddhism, um, was very, very interesting and attractive. And many texts were being translated into European languages at this time in the early part of the 20th century. And Jung had the opportunity to visit India uh, in 19, uh, leaving uh, in December of 1938 and staying there for a couple of months. 
And he traveled with a group of people who had been invited to celebrate uh, one of the universities in India, Calcutta. Uh, and uh, uh, there were uh, quite a, a, a group of notable scientists from the West, mostly from the United Kingdom, from England. And Jung was included as the expert on psychology. There were physicists, chemists, many scientists. It was a scientific congress that was being held. And they um, disembarked in India uh, in December and traveled around India for a couple of months and then went to a congress in Calcutta in, uh, in uh, February of 1938. And then after that congress, Jung traveled around uh, went south to Ceylon and then traveled back home. Uh, after about two and a half months, he became quite ill while he was in India, maybe dysentery, spent a week in the hospital. I think he missed the Congress or part of the Congress. Um, however, he did have a number of very important experiences while he was there. And um, if uh, I, I think, uh, for Jung, it was important to experience the, uh, the place uh, in order to uh, really put his hands on uh, concretely the, uh, the atmosphere of the place, to absorb it, to absorb the psyche as it is lived by the people. And so the trip to India was very impressive, although he said in his autobiography, he says he went as though a monculus in a bottle. Uh, and sealed himself off to some extent from what was around him. And yet he did have a number of very important experiences while he was there. And he um, absorbed some of the uh, 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 cultural and religious atmosphere of the place. One of the places he visited while he was there was the uh, stupas of Sanchi. Um, and he describes this in his autobiography and I'm going to uh, read this uh, account because it tells you about Jung's sensitivity to the religious in general. He had what Max Weber called religious musicality. He was very sensitive to uh, religious imagery, to, uh, to religious ritual, um, and to history, deeply sensitive to uh, historical um, and symbolic uh, uh, artifacts in the world around him. Um, so uh, when he visited the stupas of Sanchi, he says, where Buddha delivered his fire sermon, sermon, I was overcome by a strong emotion of the kind that frequently develops in me when I encounter a thing, person, or idea of whose significance I am still unconscious. So Jung noticed while he there, here's a picture of the stupa at Sanchi. Jung noticed immediately when he was being taken on this visit to uh, this uh, historic place where Buddha delivered one of his early uh, sermons, the fire sermon, um, that uh, he was beginning to react in a very particular way. Um, the um, the text reads, um, the stupas are situated on a rocky hill whose peak can be reached by a pleasant path of a great stone slabs laid down through the green meadow. The stupas are tombs or containers of relics, hemispherical in shape, like two gigantic rice bowls placed one on top of the other, <clears throat> concavity upon concavity, according to the prescripts of the Buddha himself. The British have done their restoration work in a most respectful spirit. The largest of these buildings is surrounded by a wall which has four elaborate gates. You come in by one of these and the path turns to the left, then leads into a clockwise circumambulation around the stupa. At the four cardinal points stand statues of the Buddha. When you have completed one circumambulation, you enter a second higher circuit, which runs in the same direction. The distant prospect over the plain, the stupas themselves, the temple ruins, and the solitary stillness of the holy site 
held me in a spell. I took leave of my companion and submerged myself in the overpowering mood of the place. After a while, I heard rhythmic gong tones approaching from the distance. A group of Japanese pilgrims came marching up, one behind the other, each striking a small gong. They were beating out the rhythm of the age-old prayer, Om Mani Padme Hum, the stroke of the gong falling upon the hum. Outside the stupas, they bowed low, then passed through the gate. There they bowed again before the statue of the Buddha, intoning a chorale-like song. They completed the double circumambulation, singing a hymn before each statue of the Buddha. As I watched them, my mind and spirit were with them, and something within me silently thanked them for having so wonderfully come to the aid of my inarticulate feelings. The intensity of my emotion showed that the hill of Sanchi meant something central to me. A new side of Buddhism was revealed to me there. I grasped the life of the Buddha as, as the reality of the self which had broken through and laid claim to a personal life. For Buddha, the self stands above all gods, a unus mundus, which represents the essence of human existence and of the world as a whole. Now, in that passage, you have Jung reading himself um, and interpreting his experience, which is a very deep emotional experience that he has, a numinous experience, if you will, in this Buddhist holy place, um, and relating it to his own psychological understandings. He sees Buddha as a human figure in whom the self is broken through. Uh, that's a Jungian understanding, that the self breaks through into consciousness and incarnates itself in a human consciousness to a magnificent extent in the case of, of the Buddha, and most of us to a much smaller extent. Uh, and that's what sets Buddha apart from most other human beings. He's one of a very few number of humans who have achieved that kind of full awareness of the self in Jung's understanding. And so you can see that, that Jung deeply appreciates uh, what Buddha and Buddhism have to offer and resonates to it in the place where uh, it comes from, where it belongs. Now, when he comes back to Europe, he remembers that, but he doesn't seek to uh, continue his uh, um, study of the Buddha because of it, although he had studied Buddhist texts and so on plenty before that and, and continued to do so somewhat after that. Um, but this was a time in his life when he was actually very deeply immersed in the study of Western alchemy. When he got back from his trip to India, he really turned uh, very much in the direction of uh, interpreting his own religious tradition, Christianity, and the history of the West because of the problems that the West was having at that time, of course, in the 19, late 1930s, war was about to break out and did shortly after his trip to India. And uh, then he uh, thereafter wrote his uh, great papers on the um, uh, symbolism of the Trinity, uh, the uh, archetype of sacrifice in the mass, ion, answer to Job, and so on and so forth. Um, so the, the trip to India affected him. Uh, in fact, he says, India did not pass me by without a trace. It left tracks which lead from one infinity into another infinity. So it was a, a very important experience in Jung's life. And uh, he says it didn't leave him without a trace. In other words, it had an impact. Now, I'm going to back up a bit and just review Jung's extensive um, 
writings on Indian religions, that is, on Hinduism and Buddhism. Um, if you um, take volume 11 of the collected works off the shelf, um, you'll see that it's called Psychology of Religion, Psychology and Religion West and East. And it uh, is made up of Jung's major essays on psychology and religion. About two thirds of the book are on Western religion, about one third is on religions of the East. And most of the essays in there um, are commentaries on texts that Jung was asked to write by someone who invited him to write a, a commentary on, uh, or, or give, a, give his views or interpretations on a particular Buddhist or, or Hindu text, um, or um, also uh, as he was teaching his seminar at the Eteha in Zurich, he took up a number of Buddhist texts or interpretation there. Um, these are, um, I wouldn't say casual, but they are not of the, of the same standing and significance as his writings on Western religions. And yet they're very interesting. And you can see, uh, looking through Jung's uh, collected works, um, that he has an eye out for um, material from the Indian religion from very early on, from 1911, uh, when he wrote The Psychology of the Unconscious, uh, or the Wandlungen on Symbola der Libido, uh, Transformations and Symbols of the Libido, as it's called in German, translated in 1915 as The Psychology of the Unconscious. There's a, a chapter in there, chapter three of part two, called The Transformation of the Libido. And in there, there's quite a lot of material from um, Hindu religion, uh, etymological studies of particular words, have to do largely with fire symbolism. Um, and what Jung is working on there is very early uh, transformations or sublimations of, of sexual energy uh, into other directions. Uh, he's still a Freudian at this period, 1911. And so he's, he's thinking more along the lines of sublimation of sexuality into other cultural directions or, or spiritual activities uh, than he would later. Uh, but there's a lot of material uh, 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 from uh, Hindu texts. Um, and it's interesting that um, in, in uh, the study of this material, it's, it's become known that Emma Jung uh, assisted him in the etymological research. Uh, so he drew his wife into this project as well. And um, maybe she had some special gift for languages or uh, time on her hands when she could study, although she had a bunch of small children at home at that time. But nevertheless, she did etymological research by his side, and he incorporated, incorporated this material into this uh, text that would eventually become volume five of the collected works. Um, and so we see from that that <clears throat> very early on uh, in his career, uh, this would be about 10 years in, come from 1900 onward, when he began his study of psychiatry. He's right in the middle of this Freudian period here, coming toward the end of it. Uh, he's begun to really look into the history uh, of formation of, of the human psyche, what lies at the foundations, and he's, and he's reaching for what would eventually become the theory of archetypes, his theory of archetypes as the building blocks of the human psyche. Uh, and so what he finds in uh, uh, Indian religion here are what he would later call archetypal images, that is, uh, symbols uh, of the collective unconscious that go into the formation of a culture and eventually the formation of individual attitudes uh, that uh, make up the population of that culture. And this is a very, very old tradition going back three, 4,000 years and uh, preceding uh, most of uh, what we have in the West. So he's reaching as far back as he can at that time to find the source and origins of uh, the, the development, uh, the later development of the psyche as we know it today. Then uh, 
<clears throat> of course, we have the Red Book period after that, in which Isdabar comes uh, to the foreground and uh, Jung realizes that the East, uh, the sun is too bright in the East, he better be careful with what he does there. <clears throat> and he decides to stick with his own material and with Western um, religious material more than with the Eastern. Um, and you see in the Red Book itself, uh, quite a few references to uh, Eastern religion, to Indian uh, symbols and, and uh, 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 references to uh, texts that Jung had been studying earlier, possibly that, that come to the foreground as he's working on <clears throat> the paintings and, the, uh, and his interpretation of the text of his active imagination. Um, but the predominant uh, uh, figures, the strongest figures by far in the Red Book come out of his own tradition, out of biblical tradition, of Elijah and Salome, Philemon, the, the Gnostic teacher. Um, these are the, uh, uh, Jesus himself appears several times uh, in the uh, Red Book uh, materials. So um, while the East is represented there, it's more in the background. It's, it's uh, re uh, recessive or uh, not, not the uh, major leitmotifs of the work, whereas the Western uh, images are much more uh, predominant. Um, in the midst of his Red Book work, uh, Jung publishes Psychological Types. This is in 1921. He's been working on that for uh, a number of years um, and uh, finally brings it to uh, fruition in 1921. And in there, there's a chapter, again, that uh, uh, draws very heavily on uh, some Indian religious texts. This is chapter uh, five part three, it's called the significance of the uniting symbol. And there he uh, draws on the Brahmanic, Brahmanic conception of the problem of opposites and the uniting symbol, um, as well as then making a reference to the uniting symbol, the Tao in Chinese philosophy. So uh, in studying the uh, problem of opposites and how to unite them, which is a, a an issue that Jung will be dealing with for the rest of his life, culminating in his great alchemy work, Mysterium Conjunctionis, the uniting of the opposites. Um, he is uh, uh, drawing on um, Eastern wisdom uh, because in the Brahmanic conception, problem of opposites can be surmounted. You can rise above them. There is a, a symbol that uh, that uh, unites them and uh, surpasses them and transcends them. Um, and so this is what Jung is looking for. But at the same time, a little earlier, he wrote his a paper on the transcendent function, uh, which is an attempt to uh, describe um, how a relationship between conscious and unconscious can be achieved through what he calls the transcendent function and thereby, again, uniting the opposites, conscious and unconscious, uh, two uh, sets of um, mental operations that are going on in us all the time uh, that need to be somehow linked up and connected. And so uh, Jung is, is looking far afield to find uh, uniting symbols, and he finds them in the East. Um, so again, uh, uh, the uh, religions of the East are on his mind, and he draws from them, and he can use them in his theoretical work. And then um, in 1932, um, Jung uh, participates in a uh, seminar at the Psychological Club in Zurich uh, called the Psycholo Psychology of Kundalini Yoga. This is a no uh, notes on the seminar given in 1932, edited by Sonu Shandasani. And, um, the uh, uh, seminar was a joint effort on the part of uh, a German 
scholar named Hauer, H-A-U-E-R, uh, speaking from uh, the position of a uh, Indologist, a, a scholar of Indian religions, uh, yoga in particular. Uh, Hauer had lived for a period of time as a missionary in India, and uh, like Richard Wilhelm, was proud that he had never baptized a single person in the course of his mission work, missionary work, but had become uh, extremely uh, fascinated and uh, conversant in the religions of the people he was sent out to convert to Christianity. And uh, he was a student of languages. He could read Sanskrit. And he was uh, really a first-rate scholar in a German university. He came to Zurich, gave lectures on Kundalini Yoga, and Jung provided a uh, psychological interpretation. Um, these lectures lasted over the course of a week or two in the fall of 1932. And um, uh, this volume, uh, Psychology of Kundalini Yoga, is available as a supplement to the collected works. Uh, Sonu Shambhasani has written an excellent introduction in which he gives uh, a detailed description of the seminar itself, who was in it, who said what, what they stood for, and uh, uh, a good uh, account of Jung's interest in the materials and also his resistance, in a sense, to the materials. Whenever Jung wrote about these Eastern texts or spoke about them, he commented on how strange they were to him and how strange they were to the, uh, to the eyes and minds of Westerners. And this strangeness um, uh, uh, is, a, is a feature of almost every uh, commentary uh, that he writes. He finds them strange but fascinating, and he grapples with them, and he tries to understand them from his psychological point of view. So he looks upon the chakras. There are seven chakras in the Kundalini system uh, that are located in various parts of the body, from the waist up to the top of the head, seven centers. And he speaks of them, describes them as states of consciousness. And he links them up with uh, the individuation process as uh, he understands it and as he describes it um, in his other works. Now, when uh, uh, specialists, endologists come and uh, take a look at what Jung has to say, they often disagree with his conclusions. They say, well, that isn't what the text really say. You aren't taking into account the ontological element, the metaphysical element that they're talking about, the transformations of the body and so on. You're talking about states of consciousness. Well, um, it sounds like you're just trying to uh, uh, convert these texts into uh, your psychology. In a sense, that's what Jung does, but uh, he's also grappling with them and trying to understand how to relate to them. And he does that from his position as a psychologist. He's not a scholar of, of religions. He's not, a, he doesn't read the languages of these texts, the original languages. And so he has to rely on translations. And mostly what he's interested in is the psychological aspects. And so it's a very interesting book to read. And I recommend it highly uh, to, um, to get a, an impression of how Jung thinks about the stages of consciousness as represented in Kundalini Yoga. Um, then uh, just going through a number of other texts that he writes on, on India in 1936, he writes about yoga and the West. Um, and this was written for a, a journal in India. And again, he gives his impressions uh, from a Western point of view about yoga and how the, the West can look upon yoga and relate to it, but always maintaining his stance very self-consciously as a, a Western psychologist, a psychiatrist, uh, a, a person who, who deals uh, with uh, problems in psychotherapy and uh, individuation. Um, and then uh, in 1938 and 39, he gives a number of lectures, quite extensive lectures on a, a couple of uh, yoga sutras. Uh, these are at his um, uh, location in Zurich, his professorship at the uh, um, uh, Technical 
Federal Technical University in Zurich, the Eidgenössische Technische Hochschule, ETH as we call it, where Jung would hold weekly lectures um, on various subjects having to do with psychology for the benefit of the, the uh, science students, uh, science and mathematics are the main subjects uh, in the ETH, but also the public was invited. So it was quite a large attendance uh, to these lectures. And toward the end of them, he began in 1933-34, and he's concluding now in the late 30s. Um, he turns to uh, interpretation of these sutras, two su yoga sutras. And this is found in, uh, in a, a work that is now being edited for publication by Philemon Foundation through the peer in a couple of years. It has been available in a uh, informal uh, mimeograph form that was available from the Jung Institute in Zurich. I don't know if it still is or not. Um, but uh, these are uh, notes taken from the lectures held from October 38 until March 1939. Now you'll see this comes right after Jung's trip to India. And so it, maybe his trip had an influence on his choice of subjects here. And then in 1939, for an English language magazine, Asia, he writes an essay called The Dream World, The Dreamlike World of India. <clears throat> and there he gives a, a description of his experience there and how um, unusual from a, from a European uh, standpoint, how, how different uh, the culture of India struck him. He says it was like walking around in a dream. Uh, it was very hard to get your feet on the ground. Everything seemed sort of quasi unreal. Um, and, uh, <coughs> and he compares and contrasts the two cultures. And uh, he is very aware of the importance of cultural difference, that our cultures really deeply mold us and form us, and uh, that history is important uh, so that that's one of the main reasons he wouldn't step out of his own tradition and try to adopt uh, the practices, uh, the disciplines of uh, traditions from other cultures. He felt that in order to really benefit deeply from any of these practices, you have to be uh, a member of that culture. You have to be deeply immersed in it. You need the languages. You need the history behind you. Um, otherwise, it, uh, it's very superficial. And it blocks out uh, what your own unconscious would want to offer you. It, it creates a barrier. Um, and then he, uh, again, he writes in another article in 1939, what India can teach us. Well, it can teach us really about the importance of introversion. That Jung looked upon India as basically Indian spirituality at any rate, uh, as a culture of introversion, whereas in the West, um, uh, we have a culture of extroversion. In the West, it's much more important to be good and do good, have high ethical standards, uh, to help your neighbor, treat, treat your neighbor as yourself, and so on. Uh, Christianity teaches us uh, try to transform the world, change the world in an extroverted way. Those are Western attitudes. In the East, uh, it took a very different direction through their introversion. Uh, they discovered uh, uh, realms of psyche that are, are still to be approached by us. Jung felt they have a lot to teach us. They've gone much further than we have. Uh, and maybe by looking deeply into what they've discovered, we can, uh, we can learn something very important for ourselves, although it's a mistake to try to just jump in there and imitate it. 1943, The Psychology of Eastern Meditation. He gave a, a lecture uh, in Swiss Society of Friends of East Asian Culture in Zurich. Um, and again, he's reflecting on the similarities and differences between active imagination and Western practices, uh, uh, prayer and so on, uh, directed meditation like the um, Ignatian exercises and Eastern meditation. And he talks about the psychology of Eastern meditation as a deeply introverted uh, path uh, appropriate to the people of that culture. The Holy Men of India in 1944, he wrote as an introduction to papers by Heinrich Simmer, who was a good friend of his and an Indologist. 
a man uh, deeply immersed uh, uh, in Indian philosophy and uh, symbolism and religion, wrote uh, many books on the subject, immigrated from uh, Germany to America during the 30s, uh, leaving Germany because of the Nazis, and uh, became a professor at Columbia University, and uh, died unexpectedly in early death in the early 1940s and left some papers behind, which Jung uh, edited and um, uh, brought into publication as Der Weg zum Selbst, The Way to the Self. And in, as an introduction to that book, he writes an essay called The Holy Men of India, in which he talks about uh, what their methods of uh, uh, introversion will produce in the way of uh, an individuation process. Holy men of India are not something for us to imitate, but for some, some, but to, but to study and admire uh, in that they have achieved a level of transcendence uh, that is uh, unthinkable in the West. Um, and in 1956, uh, Jung wrote a very short piece uh, on the discourses of the Buddha. And, uh, uh, and then finally in 1956, also prefaced to an Indian Journal of Psychotherapy. So he stayed in touch with Indian materials uh, throughout the rest of his life, commenting and uh, interacting with various figures who were uh, interested in um, Indian uh, philosophy and religion. Now the other great um, region, um, uh, having to do uh, reference to, a, to our subject of Eastern religions is China. And Chinese uh, um, religion is uh, uh, different from, from Indian religion, from our religion. It's, it almost doesn't qualify as religion. It's, it's kind of a philosophical view of life, uh, uh, Taoism and uh, Confucianism, a way of living, uh, uh, relatively little emphasis on the transcendent, although in Taoism they certainly have that in the practice of Taoism, not so much in the philosophy of Taoism. Uh, but Jung was uh, very interested in uh, China for a couple of reasons. Um, he made contact with China and Chinese uh, 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 materials uh, quite early. They're already referenced in his uh, works like uh, psychological types, but the key figure uh, that really turned him on to China was Richard Wilhelm, who he met um, in the early 1920s in Darmstadt at the School of Wisdom, founded by Count, Count uh, Hermann von Kaiserling. Kaiserling uh, was a German intellectual who traveled widely, went to India, went to China, actually visited Wilhelm in China, came back and wrote a best-selling book on his travels and what he had learned uh, about Eastern wisdom on his journeys. And when he came back, he founded the School of Wisdom in Darmstadt, Germany. And many uh, interesting and important uh, intellectual figures, European figures um, and Indian figures, Tagore, for instance, came there and uh, gave some lectures uh, from India. Um, and uh, Jung went on several occasions and met a couple of very important uh, people became important for his life, and one of them was Richard Wilhelm. Um, and uh, he uh, had an immediate liking for Wilhelm. Wilhelm uh, was a German uh, Protestant missionary to China for 20 years, lived in Qingdao, um, and uh, like Hauer, uh, who was a missionary to India, said that in his 20 years of missionary work, he never baptized a single Chinese. But he did fall in love with Chinese culture and translated many classical, classic texts, Chinese texts into German. Um, among them, uh, one that was very important for Jung, uh, uh, The Secret of the Golden Flower. Uh, another one was the I Ching. And through this friendship with Wilhelm, uh, Jung came in contact with uh, the um, really the foundations of Chinese culture and religion and philosophy in a way he could have never done otherwise. Uh, 
this picture is taken in the Richard Wilhelm house as it looks today. Um, uh, we visited in, in 2013 and uh, the house has been restored by the Chinese and is being used for educational purposes. And on the third floor, they have a memorial uh, to Richard Wilhelm, who <clears throat> was responsible for the construction of this house and the school uh, next door to it. Um, when uh, Wilhelm introduced Jung to uh, Chinese uh, philosophy and, and uh, practices in a couple of lectures at the Psychological Club in the 1920s, um, and also translated the I Ching, uh, which was published in German in the 1920s, Jung became extremely fascinated with uh, those materials and with what uh, Wilhelm had to say about Chinese culture. And again, he was uh, keen on um, appropriating uh, some of the wisdom from China for his own psychology. In uh, 1928, Wilhelm sent Jung a translation of a Chinese uh, alchemy text uh, called The Secret of the Golden Flower and asked Jung if he'd be interested in writing a commentary. And this is one of many commentaries that Jung would write on Eastern uh, religions and philosophy and so on at the request of somebody or other. And this came at the request and invitation of Richard Wilhelm. And they would produce a book together, uh, Wilhelm's translation of this uh, Chinese alchemy text and Jung's commentary. Um, Jung's commentary is, you can find in Collected Works 13, of uh, his um, um, Collected Works of Xi Jiu Jung. Now, when Jung started reading this text, he, he was somewhat interested, but not, uh, not uh, gripped by it. But the more he got into it, the more uh, fascinated he became. And finally, he wrote a really marvelous commentary in which he compares many of his concepts of uh, insights about individuation with what was happening in Chinese alchemy. And this really turned him on to alchemy. This was a pivotal moment in Jung's intellectual life where uh, he turned from, uh, actually stopped writing uh, further pages in the Red Book, closed it, and began reading alchemy texts, Western alchemy, but his first exposure was Chinese alchemy. And there he saw this, uh, the, the method that the Chinese alchemists used uh, and their goals, he thought corresponded uh, almost word for word, line for line, step by step with what he had experienced in his own uh, individuation process and with his patients, that they were uh, uh, working along similar paths. And this gave him uh, the, um, the uh, what should I say, a, 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 a proof or a, a, a evidence, some evidence that the individuation process is archetypal, that it's not idiosyncratic, it's not culture bound, it's not only for the Western people who've fallen out of their religious traditions and can't go back and have to do something else, uh, but that the individuation process is actually deeply human and can be found cross-culturally and throughout different eras and periods of time. And so uh, <clears throat> he says about this moment that it really uh, released him from his uh, feeling of being uh, isolated uh, in the West and in, in his own uh, process, that it opened the doors to uh, much broader perspectives. And so he was very grateful to Wilhelm and he wrote a magnificent commentary on the secret of the golden flower in which he describes his own process of active imagination, technique of active imagination as compared with the alchemists were doing and the results, the goals. And he um, translates certain Chinese terms like Tao into um, uh, psychological language. So he makes a psychological translation of the Chinese philosophical terminology. Um, his second great uh, text on uh, Chinese matters, Chinese uh, practice and philosophy, 
is the foreword that he wrote to the I Ching. This was in 1950. Um, Richard Wilhelm died a very early death uh, um, from an illness that he picked up in China. He died in 1930, unfortunately. Uh, early in, in his life, he would have had many more contributions to make, and his collaboration with, from, with Jung was just getting started. Um, but he had done a lot of translating, and um, probably the most famous of them all was the I Ching. He translated it into German. Um, and um, Jung immediately said to Carrie Baines, uh, uh, most associate of his at the time, and a translator, excellent translator, you've got to translate this book into English. So Carrie Baines started uh, doing that, and uh, it took 20 years to finally bring it out. It came out in 1950. And when it came out in English, uh, Jung wrote a foreword to it. And uh, surprisingly, it became a bestseller in English. Uh, it hit at just the right moment. People started to read it, and then it really took off in the 1960s with the New Age movement. Everybody had a copy of the I Ching. Everybody was consulting it and casting uh, their euro stocks or coins to get hexagrams that would tell them what to do next. Uh, and uh, it became a very popular work. Well, Jung's foreword to the I Ching is extremely interesting um, uh, because he um, uh, finds it a difficult work, he struggles with it, uh, and then finally he comes around to the point where he says, I'm going to ask you a question, I Ching, and he addresses the I Ching as though it were a person. He throws uh, and, uh, the coins or stocks, and he comes up with a hexagram, number 50, the uh, cauldron. And, um, and then he interprets it, and uh, uh, comes to the conclusion that the forecast is that the I Ching is going to have a hard time at first in the West. People aren't going to understand it, but in the end, it's going to do very well. And that was a very good forecast. Um, if you had invested in the I Ching in the early days and held on to the investment, you would have done very well over the next 50 years. It's still selling well. Um, and so that was a, a further engagement. Uh, and in the um, uh, introduction to the I Ching, Jung writes, the I Ching does not offer itself with proofs and results, does not vaunt itself, nor is it easy to approach. Like a part of nature, it waits until it is discovered. It offers neither facts nor power, but for lovers of self-knowledge, of wisdom, be there, if there be such, it seems to be the right book. To one person, its spirit appears as clear as day, to another, shadowy as twilight. To a third, dark as night. He who is not pleased by it does not have to use it, and he who is against it is not obliged to find it true. Let it go forth into the world for the benefit of those who can discern its meaning. And with that, he launched it into the world, and it did very well. Another topic that Jung discusses in a couple of um, uh, essays is Tibetan Buddhism. Here you see a picture of the Dalai Lama re receiving Jung's Red Book um, uh, at, a, at a ceremony a few years ago in, uh, in India. And um, I don't know if he studied it deeply or uh, what he thinks of it, but he, does, he has had connections to Jungians, important connections to Jungians in Zurich. So I imagine he will find it quite interesting and will spend some time uh, looking at the pictures and, and reading the text. But Jung's writings on Tibetan Buddhism <clears throat> occurred in the 1930s when he was invited to uh, contribute psychological commentaries, uh, one on the Tibetan Book of the Dead and the other one on the Tibetan Book of the Great Liberation. And in these, if you read these, you see Jung uh, being very, very uh, creative uh, with his uh, approach to the text. Uh, with the Tibetan Book of the Dead, he turns it upside down, so to speak, reads it backwards, and says, for the Tibetans, the beginning is enlightenment, and it goes downhill from there. With us, it starts at the bottom, and it moves toward enlightenment. And so he takes the stages of the prayers for the dead, uh, uh, 
as uh, steps in the individuation process, but in reverse. And so he has interesting things to say about the text and about individuation. Uh, again, uh, looking at uh, an, a traditional Eastern ancient text from a very um, contemporary and uh, uh, scient scientific, psychological uh, point of view, from his point of view. And then in the uh, commentary of the Tibetan Book of the Great Liberation, he, he wrestles with the mentality that's revealed in this text. He really struggles with it. Um, he interprets some of the terminology, and then he cautions Western people who want to, uh, to imitate foreign methods. Again, a very familiar uh, uh, statement that he makes so often in his writings. Then there are his writings on Buddhism. Um, Buddhism is uh, probably uh, Jung's favorite Eastern tradition, if you want to, maybe uh, that's putting it a little too strongly, but he does seem to be drawn to it. Uh, uh, and I'll explain uh, just how and why. Uh, 1939, he writes a foreword to Suzuki's introduction to Zen Buddhism. And there he uh, tries to interpret the experience of Satori, enlightenment, from uh, a psychological point of view. Um, again, he finds that not easy because um, it, Satori seems to transcend um, all human conflict, all uh, uh, psychological uh, particularities, all sensations, uh, really to rise above or out of this world in a moment of um, uh, vision, of emptiness, of uh, peace. Um, and Jung has difficulty with that because he doesn't see it so much as a part of his uh, life and a part of his practice, but he can appreciate it and he keeps an eye on it um, and he wants to know more about it. And so he continues um, uh, thinking about it for the rest of his life. Uh, and uh, Suzuki was someone that he met uh, in Switzerland who gave a lecture at the Eranos Tagum uh, in Ascona and um, asked Jung to write an introduction to this book, which again became a very important book in the West. This introduction to Zen Buddhism really introduced Zen uh, to the Western world. Uh, it's a classic, and Jung's introduction to it, and Jung's name on the book helped to launch it, as his name on the I Ching helped to launch that book. Um, in 1956, he wrote a uh, uh, a short uh, uh, essay on the discourses of the Buddha. Um, and here he uh, takes a different turn from what he usually says. Here he actually recommends the use of Buddhist thought and uh, practice to alleviate psychic suffering. Um, he says Buddhist practice and teaching can be therapeutic. And um, here he's anticipating what uh, has become so uh, well known and widely used, indeed super popular uh, in uh, many um, psychotherapeutic circles, the practice of mindfulness, teaching and practicing what is called mindfulness. There are many books on this subject. It's a very popular topic among psychotherapists. And it really bypasses uh, usual forms of psychotherapy, which look into history, into the past, into conflicts, into what's going on, the dreams, and so on. It's simply stilling the mind. And um, it doesn't quite uh, approach Satori. It isn't uh, a kind of radical breakthrough into, into the other, into, into a, uh, a vision of uh, completeness and wholeness that Satori would be, Satori. But uh, it does... Um, calm the mind sufficiently that some people don't need to take um, anti, uh, uh, depressants or anti-anxiety drugs, uh, or at least reduce the dosage. Um, and especially in a stressful, fast-paced, um, 
modern world that, that most of us live in today, uh, the practice of mindfulness can be extremely helpful. Here, you, 1956, you have Jung writing exactly the same thing um, and uh, recommending uh, uh, these practices to people who uh, uh, don't find help for their psychic suffering in other ways. Sometimes psychotherapy doesn't help either, and uh, mindfulness can be a better approach than traditional psychotherapy. That's what Jung is saying here. Late in his life, 1956, it's quite a remarkable statement that he makes. And then there's the famous conversation in 1958 with the Zen master, Shinichi Izamatsu. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, a conversation that was recorded and uh, published uh, after the uh, event, uh, Master Izamatsu came to Zurich to interview Jung. He had been to the United States talking to a number of scholars and philosophers and so on, sharing his um, experience as a Zen master, his insights. And here he has a dialogue with Jung, and they talk about, um, um, among other things, uh, transcendence. Here's Izamatsu. The essential point of this liberation, as it's called in uh, Zen Buddhism, where you have the satori experience, your mind is liberated so that you're no, no longer troubled by your conflicts and uh, your past and so on. The essential point of this liberation is how we can be awakened to our original self, as Matsu says. So that's satori, how we can be awakened to our original self. The original self is the self which is no longer bound by a myriad of things. To attain this self is the essential point of freedom. So freedom, liberation, these are the themes. It is necessary, therefore, to release oneself, even from the collective unconscious and the bondage which derives from it. So Izumatsu says, even getting beyond uh, the collective unconscious, beyond where active imagination can take you, is necessary to achieve liberation. And again, Jung, very surprisingly, he says, if one is caught in a myriad of things and thus bound within it, this is because he is caught within the collective unconscious at the same time. He can be freed only when he is liberated from both of them. So he's agreeing with his mantra. One person may be dragged along more by the unconscious, another by things, conscious, matters of consciousness. In short, through liberation, man must be brought to a point where he is free from the compulsion to chase after a myriad of things and from being controlled by the collective unconscious. Both are fundamentally the same. Nirvana. So uh, here Jung is uh, coming along uh, to a point of uh, quite radical point of agreement with Izumatsu. Izumatsu says, in what you have just said about the unconscious, Professor Jung, do you mean that the collective unconscious is something from which in its nature we can free ourselves? Jung says, yes, it is. So uh, this is one of the few times, maybe the only time, that Jung never said such a thing. It may have been under the influence of Izumatsu, that Izumatsu was so persuasive, and that Jung perhaps had some experiences toward the end of his life that uh, moved in this direction that he could affirm exactly what Izumatsu was saying, going back to what um, uh, Suzuki had said about Satori so long before that Jung didn't understand at that time as completely, uh, and in the following years perhaps came to this uh, point. Now, Buddha's fire sermon, which is uh, what was given by Buddha, I think was his fourth sermon uh, at that stupa that Jung visited in India, this is the fire sermon, and the fire sermon is a sermon about how to be released or liberated from desire. It says, by burning is meant the fire of passion, the fire of aversion, the fire of delusion, the manifestations of suffering, birth, aging and death, sorrows, lamentations, pains, distresses and despairs. According to the Buddha, a well-instructed noble disciple sees this burning and thus becomes disenchanted with the sense bases and their mental sequelae. The text then uses the formula found in dozens of discourses to describe the manner in which the, such disenchantment leads to liberation from suffering. Disenchanted, he becomes dispassionate. Through dispassion, he is fully released. 
With full release, there is the knowledge, fully released. He discerns that birth is ended, the holy life fulfilled, the task done. There is nothing further for this world. A close closing paragraph reports that during this discourse, the thousand monks in attendance became liberated. That was a tremendous sermon that Buddha gave there, the fire sermon, about how to be released and freed from suffering. And that's what um, Izabatsu is saying to Jung that Zen uh, Buddhism strives for, and Jung is saying, yes, that's very important. Um, how do you get there? Uh, you have to also be freed from the collective unconscious, and perhaps that's a possibility. On Jung's bedside table, uh, June 6, 1961, that's the day he passed away, was this book, uh, Chuan and Zen Teaching by um, Charles Luke. And von Franz uh, gave a, a, a short uh, sentence or two far in the back of this book, uh, where she says uh, that uh, Jung was enthusiastic. When he read what Su Yun said, he sometimes felt as if he himself could have said exactly this. It was just it. So this is the last thing that Jung was reading. You could say maybe the last thing that was on his mind before he passed away. Um, and this is Chan Buddhism, which is uh, the forerunner of Zen Buddhism. Uh, so as I said earlier, I think in the end, Jung preferred Buddhism uh, probably to all the other Eastern traditions and maybe even to his own religious tradition because of this promise of release and freedom. Um, this is a passage from this book uh, that Jung was reading. And one can think that perhaps he passed his eyes over this, and this is what he was talking about when he says, this is what I could have said. He says, the text says, there is nothing special about what I do each day. This is, this is being said by um, a Zen student, a Zen master. There is nothing special about what I do each day. I only keep myself in harmony with it. Everywhere, I neither accept nor reject anything. Nowhere do I confirm or refute a thing. Why do people say that red and purple differ? There's not a speck of dust on the Blue Mountain. Supernatural powers and wonder-making works are but fetching water and the gathering of wood. Now this kind of simplicity, uh, being in the moment, um, uh, living in the present moment, freed from the past and freed from the pressures of fantasy and expectation and delusion and illusion, living simply is what Buddhism uh, hopes to achieve in the end through its practices and teachings. And I think Jung was fully in accord. If, uh, if his uh, psychotherapy could arrive at the same goal, he would have been very satisfied. Um, to close, I just want to make reference to a number of works that have been written on the subject of Jung in the East. Um, and this is a, a, select, uh, uh, a selection of, of possible texts. I, uh, it's what I've collected, but I'm sure there are more, and I'm sure in other languages there are many as well. These are all in English, uh, but I would guess that in other languages, like I'm sure in Japanese uh, and uh, in, uh, in French and uh, German, and Italian, there would be many other uh, uh, reflections on Jung's relation to the East as well. Um, from this list, I would want to highlight a couple. Um, a man named Clark, In Search of Jung, Spiritual Traditions East and West. It's an excellent book uh, that really, uh, in chapter six, talks about uh, Jung's relationship to the East and comparison with the West. And then his introduction to Jung on the East is also very fine. Um, 
Harold Coward, 1985, Jung and Eastern Thought is an excellent, excellent study. And then um, Professor Kawai, who was the, uh, fa the, uh, the founder of Jungian work and, and the Jungian movement in Japan, graduated from the Jung Institute in Zurich in the 1960s, wrote many, many books in Japanese on Jungian topics. And several of them have been translated into English. I'm told he wrote, published over 100 books in his lifetime. He became a very well-known cultural figure in Japan, minister of culture for, for the Japanese government at the end of his life. Um, and three books of his that are in English um, are very uh, valuable for uh, seeing how a, a person from one of these cultures that Jung is writing about at a great distance, never visited Japan, um, has incorporated uh, Western psychology, Jungian psychology, taken it back and reflected on what it means to be a Jungian analyst in Japanese culture. And looking at Japanese culture through the lens of analytical psychology as he learned it in Los Angeles uh, initially and then in Zurich where he trained. So these three books um, are highly to be recommended. The Japanese Psyche, Major Motifs and Fairy Tales of Japan, The Buddhist Priest Mayoi, A Life of Dreams. And this is a Jungian reflection on a 13th and 14th century Buddhist priest and uh, his uh, dream journal. And then Buddhism and the Art of Psychotherapy, where, which is quite autobiographical, where Kawai uh, reflects on his experience as a uh, Jungian psychotherapist, psychoanalyst in a Japanese culture after he returned to it as a relatively young man and spent the rest of his life working in Japan, a professor of psychology at the University of Kyoto, and in his practice and, and his public life, uh, representing Jungian psychology there. Uh, very uh, personal and moving reflection on um, how he managed to put together these two cultures, recognizing that his roots are in Buddhism, Buddhist, you know, deeply Buddhist culture, Japan, um, and his um, training, his conscious uh, uh, formation as a professional took place in the West and how he had to struggle to put these two things together. And then a very interesting book published just a couple of years ago by Sulanga Sengupta, Jung in India. This describes Jung's trip to India in detail, day-by-day uh, -day account. And there you see what Jung uh, saw and experienced and uh, suffered uh, on his trip to India with, along with reflections uh, by the author on what all of this meant for his psychology. And then uh, Sonu Shandasani's introduction um, uh, to the psychology of Kundalini Yoga, which I've mentioned, also an excellent review of Jung's writings on um, the, these topics, Indian religion, and uh, what they meant for him, and, uh, and a critical review of, of Jung's work. Uh, and then a collection of essays published a few years ago, a couple of years ago, by Polly Young Eisenrath, Buddhism and Death Psychology, Refining the Encounter. <clears throat> so what has happened since um, Jung's death is um, that uh, Jungian analysts, East and West, have continued working on this interface and dialogue uh, between uh, Western psychotherapy and its philosophy, philosophical background and its uh, perspectives and attitudes and um, various uh, religious traditions from the East. And this one has to do with Buddhism. Pali Young Eisenrath has studied and practiced Buddhism for many years, has written about it. And in this collection of papers, she publishes some and others, other Jungian analysts contribute to it. Uh, you have a, a kind of up-to-date, contemporary, postmodern, perhaps, uh, dialogue between uh, Buddhism and depth psychology. For us today, uh, the world looks very different from what it did in Jung's time. Um, 
these foreign parts don't look so other, so foreign, so different, so exotic. They're much closer. We can travel there quickly uh, by airplane. Um, many of us have spent uh, considerable amounts of time um, in these uh, uh, countries in India, Japan, um, China, um, and Taiwan, Korea, um, where um, Jungian psychology is now planted quite firmly, is being practiced, and a, uh, a growing and burgeoning um, literature is, is coming along, <laughs> which is um, reflecting back to us in the West how these practices um, are taking place in the East and how they're being modified and perhaps extended or expanded or changed. And so the dialogue really, I would say, is in, still in its early stages, but it's certainly more advanced than when you began it all uh, over 50 years ago. Um, uh, in some cases, almost 100 years ago, uh, with his first publications. Um, and so that uh, I think Jung's uh, tentativeness about uh, uh, including uh, practices and um, uh, images and so on from uh, Eastern religions and traditions, his, his hesitancy, his, his almost his fear, you could say, that we might lose ourselves and lose our grounding is much less today than it was. Maybe it shouldn't be. <laughs> Maybe we're still in danger and don't know it. But it does seem uh, easier for us than it did then because so much work has been done on it in the meantime, um, in the universities, in uh, many, many popular uh, media, uh, film, uh, magazines, newspapers, um, so that we uh, are much more accustomed to the otherness of these particular cultures. And uh, I think the, the dialogue is perhaps um, uh, still in its early stages in the sense of going deeply, as Jung tried to go deeply into the uh, uh, ancient materials and ancient texts, the sources of these religions, their archetypal underpinnings, <clears throat> but on the surface at least, we're much more familiar with the people there and they with us so that uh, dialogues uh, can take place today that probably couldn't take place in Jung's time. Um, but I think we still have to work very hard to make those important dialogues and deep dialogues that really are encounters and dialogues in the deepest sense of hearing and speaking from our established cultural positions and not agreeing too quickly or thinking we understand something before we really do. Um, so I think that has been um, the uh, amount of time allotted for this webinar. I hope you've appreciated it and um, it has been enjoyable to prepare for it and to read through these texts again. They are so rich and uh, I uh, uh, advocate uh, and recommend all of them to careful study. Jung is endlessly fascinating. Uh, and when he picks up these materials and reflects on them psychologically, we still have a lot to, to learn from him. Mm. Thank you so much, Murray. What a, a marvelous presentation. Oh, I really enjoy this one. I enjoy them all, but boy, this one really connected some deep ways with the Eastern, especially that Buddhism you know, piece you know, towards the end. Um, left me and I suspect a lot of other listeners kind of hungry to go deeper with that. You and I just spoke yesterday about what our next you know, seminars might look like in the, uh, the fall time. And then, you know, I will keep talking, but I'd love to explore some of these options from Buddhism, you know, Zen, you know, Tibetan, uh, mindfulness. You know, each one of those areas are just so rich. And there's so many opportunities with that. And uh, boy, there's so much Jung wrote uh, in most of these areas. And it's, there's a lot of depth that we could keep going with. So thank you again. I really appreciate you know, today. We'll be back uh, relatively soon on the 11th of April, so a few weeks. Tony Wolfson will be joining us then on Jewish mysticism. That should be a fascinating one as well.
Um, Murray, are you going to be signing in on that one, or will be just Tony presenting? I wasn't sure. If... I will be there. Okay, excellent, excellent. So we'll have both of you here for that. Tony will be the main presenter with it. Good. Uh, so without further ado, thank you so much, yeah, Murray. Really appreciate it today, and we thank everybody for joining us. We'll see you back in a few weeks. So bye-bye. Bye-bye.